and welcome to Beyond the Scales, starting the obesity conversation, where we unravel the complexities of obesity. I'm Emily, and I'm joined by my co-host, Fran. Hi, everyone. We're two medical students on a mission to demystify obesity, as there's so much more to it than just a number. We're honoured to have consultant bariatric surgeon, Mr. Lee Humphreys, working with us on this podcast. He brings a wealth of clinical expertise to help us navigate this complex condition. Hi, Emily. Hi, Fran. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you too. So we were thinking this week we would like to talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists as uh, there's a lot of media around the subject at the moment and we just wanted to hear a bit about what you thought. Everyone else is talking about them, so we should too. 100%. So can you explain to a little bit how you describe this to a medical student? What are they? How do they work? So GLP-1s or GLP-1 receptor agonists have really hit the news in the last two years as they've really, they've really opened a new chapter in obesity treatment. And it's a class of drug that actually has been around for over 10 years. They were originally used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And it was noticed that uh, when patients were being treated for their diabetes with these drugs, they lost weight. So, of course, the drug companies who are always looking for ways to repurpose drugs um, started investigating their use for weight loss. Um, and then the first one that really sort of hit the headlines uh, and made uh, we were making progress with was liraglutide or Saxenda. And that uh, came out probably about two years or so ago in the UK. And we were seeing weight loss of uh, around 8 to 10% in certain patient groups. Now, you may think that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 8 to 10% of total body weight. And for a drug at the time, uh, it, was a real, it was really exciting. Yeah. Um, currently, uh, the one that everyone's talking about is Wagovi or semaglutide, which is uh, made by the same company that makes liraglutide. But the results with semaglutide are even better and patients are losing on average 15% of their body weight, which is really quite impressive. Uh, And semaglutide is a once weekly injection, whereas liraglutide had to be taken daily. So there's a difference between the two. Um, The the clue of how they work is in the name. So uh, GLP is a glucagon-like peptide and glucagon-like peptide uh, effectively um, stimulates insulin production, which is why the GLP-1 receptor agonist we use in type 2 diabetes. It also suppresses glucagon levels, but it, they also uh, reduce appetite. And GLP-1 receptors are found in various parts of the body, including the brain, interestingly. So there's a lot of speculation that they may well act centrally as well as in the gut. But the other thing that they do that contributes to the weight loss is they significantly decrease gastric emptying. So people feel fuller for longer. So you get appetite suppression and delayed gastric emptying and that that, those two mechanisms probably underlie why people lose weight. So how do they know it's it's safe and and are we fully aware of the side effects? Yeah, I think we are. I think the fact that they've been around for 10 years for the treatment of type 2 diabetes means that actually, you know, we do know a lot about these drugs. Now, I accept that the doses that they're given for in type 2 diabetes tend to be lower than the doses that they're given for uh, for the treatment of obesity. But there is there's a lot of safety data there. Now, like any drug, there are side effects. Yeah. And the common ones, unsurprisingly, are GI gastrointestinal side effects. So patients will commonly uh, complain of nausea, diarrhea, or constipation, one way or the other. And for most people, those side effects are transient. You start off at a low dose, and over a period of two months with Wagovi, patients are worked up onto the maximum dose. And if you get side effects, they can be mitigated usually either by staying on the dose that you were on before you went up for a longer period of time, or in some cases, reducing the dose back down. And there will be some people that won't tolerate being titrated up to the maximum dose. And of course, there will be some people that can't tolerate them at all, just like with any other treatment. As I said, but for the majority of people, those side effects are 
transient uh, and they can be well managed. Now, there's been a lot of speculation in the press about some more serious side effects. And I don't know if you've heard, but there was some coverage uh, not that long ago about them being linked to the risk of suicide. Now, that's interesting because we know after bariatric surgery, there's an increased risk of suicide. It's been an association that's been well recognized for a long period of time. Now, I personally don't think that the drugs themselves uh, cause suicidal ideations. And in fact, it has been investigated. And I don't think there's been any association actually found directly with the medication. But, you know, these are very small numbers of patients who sadly committed suicide while taking them. Um, but I think it's a bit of a stretch to say the drugs have caused suicidal ideation. But of course, it's something that needs to be looked at. Yeah. There's also the risk of um, pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas. There's a warning on the label about a theoretical risk of thyroid cancers. Uh, very, very rare type thyroid cancer and very low risk. And it's a theoretical risk. It happened in rats in clinical trials. As far as I'm aware, there's been no reported cases in humans. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about the development of gallstones in people taking GLP-1s. Now, again, that's probably more to do with rapid weight loss because we know that if you undergo rapid weight loss, you're predisposed to forming gallstones, which is one of the reasons why gallstone disease is very common after bariatric surgery. But the take home message is for most people, if the drugs are used under supervision by someone who knows what they're doing and is appropriately trained to prescribe them, they're safe. Uh, you mentioned that both the, um, both the drugs are given via injections. Um, is, is there an oral option or not? Does it, does it get absorbed or as well? So um, there, there is an oral version of smagutite. Uh, that's currently uh, in clinical trials. Uh, I think it's a phase three clinical trials. Uh, and the results are quite promising, suggesting that oral somaglicide weight loss results are very similar to injectable somaglicide. So I suspect that um, that will be the next thing for somaglicide. Uh, will be a tablet instead of an injection. It's not currently available yet, um, but it's the results are looking promising. And other companies are working on GLP-1s, uh, both injectable and oral uh, as well. I think in five to 10 years, it'll be a very different landscape to where we are now. So do you ever prescribe this or do you ever even see patients coming to you and to your bariatric clinic having tried these? So currently we can't prescribe them because there's a very significant shortage. So NICE have approved the use of semaglutide for the treatment of obesity in patients with a BMI of 35 or above with a weight-related comorbidity. Um, you can lower the BMI thresholds or you should lower the BMI thresholds by 2.5 for non-Caucasian people. Uh, because non-Caucasians get complications of obesity at lower BMI than Caucasian people. And they have to be prescribed through a specialist weight management program. And they have to be given uh, alongside lifestyle interventions and calorie restriction, because in the, in the trial that NICE got most of its data from, patients were on a calorie restriction of 500 calories a day, as well as being on the smuggler side. So NICE has basically said that, you know, if to prescribe it on the NHS, uh, you sh we should be mimicking what was uh, the conditions that were in the trial as much as possible. It's very hard to replicate trial conditions in the real world. And it'll be interesting to see whether the real world results hold up in the same way as the trial results do. But, you know, it's very promising. Once the drug becomes available, because as I said, there's a very significant worldwide shortage at the moment, then we will be able to start prescribing it through our NHS uh, special, tier three specialist weight management uh, setup. But currently we aren't. Uh, the second part of your question, yes, I am coming across people who have been getting them privately and they've been using them as part of their weight management journey to get to bariatric surgery. And what are the patients thinking about them? So again, it, it really depends on um, 
where they're getting them, how they're supervised and what the results are. Because like most things, uh, if, if patients are getting the result that they want, i.e. they're losing weight, they're more likely to tolerate some of the side effects. If they're not getting you know, weight loss and they're getting the horrible side effects that can sometimes go with it, then they're, they're not going to rate the drug. But the, the ones that I have come across on the whole have lost weight and have found it beneficial, but I have come across several people who stopped taking them because of side effects, but also stop taking them because of cost, because self-funding them privately is significantly expensive for patients. So, um, yes, but uh, on the whole, I've, I've had more met more people who have found them to be very beneficial than those who haven't. Yeah, and as obviously as um, almost popularity increases, then the cost will go up as well, is not it? Yeah. yeah. Well, the costs are going up significantly in the moment because of the fact that you can't get them on the NHS. And you know there are lots of private providers out there who are providing it, uh, not always uh, in a way that I would regard as uh, being particularly professional and or safe. And unfortunately, there are people who are falling victim to scams, buying stuff over the internet that they believe to be some aglutide and isn't. Uh, you know, you get in the post a syringe and some white powder and a vial and some water to mix it up in. I mean, who the hell knows what it is? Um, but yeah, you know, that is happening because clearly, like anything that's popular and people think there's money in it, criminals will try and make money out of people who are, you know, desperate and vulnerable. And that's very sad. Yeah. And um, for the, the medications to still work, do you still need to adapt all the different lifestyle factors that we've mentioned before, or will it just work on its own and you don't need to do them? Well, the, the answer to that is, you know, in the trial, as we've said, there was calorie restriction. And I think as part of any uh, obesity treatment, the getting the sort of fundamental basic advice about portion sizes and sensible eating and you know all of the other things that we talk about before bariatric surgery or indeed in people who just come into the weight management program who don't want bariatric surgery i think that, that that's a fundamental grounding that all patients should receive you know will they work without calorie restriction will you be able to eat whatever you like and lose weight well the answer is probably but you know, would would you lose as much weight? Uh, would you get all of the benefits if you uh, use uh, if you were using them in that way rather than using them as part of a structured program? The answer to that is I don't know, but you, my feeling is probably not. Yes, it's, it's um, yeah, fascinating, isn't it? It's, it's a quite difficult, especially if many people have particularly tried. You know, what we talked about in the last podcast with yo-yo dieting and and things like that it's if you have the money like yeah you can see why it's increasing in popularity it's yeah the side effects though would be quite and 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 of course this is part of the problem the the media hype around them has been in my view really unhelpful yeah so you've got on one hand celebrities endorsing the use of these drugs you know, saying that they've been using them to lose weight using them in a way that you know you wouldn't be able to use them if you were getting them from uh, someone who's appropriately trained and has assessed you properly people you know who aren't re- aren't obese may just be slightly overweight being you know getting them and using them just to lose a bit of weight i mean that's that's not how the drug that that's not the patient population these drugs are intended for and, you know, and it's you know, unfortunately when the media has popularized it and, and people think it's a celebrity treatment and, and we can all do it, it, it's taking away from the fact that these are, you know, these are genuine prescription only drugs. And like any prescription only drug, you should use them under the supervision of someone who knows what they're doing uh, when they prescribe them to you. But sadly, that isn't happening uh, and it's leading, it will lead to problems for people. So are there any other medications that are currently being prescribed or that are available to people? So the only other medication uh, currently licensed for obesity treatment in the UK is a drug called Orlistat, which 
has been around since about the 1990s and all this that is a lipase inhibitor so it blocks that take of fat uh, and it uh, is not particularly effective uh, and it has some pretty unpleasant side effects like steatorrhea so very fatty loose foul smelling diarrhea because if you're not absorbing the fat from your diet well where does it go out the tail end uh, and uh, fecal incontinence and uh, spotting fat in your underwear is uh, are all recognized side effects of, of all this that so you know it's it's never really been that effective in other countries, uh, particularly in the US, there are other drugs that are licensed. Uh, fenteramine, uh, which is an amphetamine, um, well, that's been around for a long time. That was licensed uh, for a while, I believe, in the UK, but it was uh, the license was withdrawn because of significant um, side effects associated with it. So there are other drugs, and I think what's exciting about the GLP ones is the combination of really quite impressive weight loss that we've never really seen with drugs before and a side effect profile that although can be unpleasant for most people they're not serious you know life-threatening or cardiac or neurological side effects like we've seen with some of the other drugs and that's really why from the from us as professionals that are with interest in treating obesity there is genuine excitement about this We've never had this before. You know, 15% weight loss is around what you would probably get with a gastric band. The next generation of drugs coming through are um, dual action drugs. So Eli Lilly's big blockbuster is called Tazapatide. That's probably gonna be licensed in the US very shortly. Tazapatide is showing around 20% weight loss in patients. So, and that's here, like, uh, that's here and, and around. And there are at least two other next generation drugs that we'll see in the next probably two to, f two to five years that are sounding like they'll be even more effective again. And so it's, a really, it's, it's exciting. We've never had multiple drugs like this and options. And there are multiple companies now exploring drugs that work in different ways because we don't, we've got GLP-1s now. So like all of these things, people will be looking for the next thing. So you know, we'll have different classes of drugs. So again, we've made the analogy with hypertension and obesity in another, po in another podcast earlier, but it's the same thing. You, know, you, you get different classes of drugs with different mechanisms of action that can be used synergistically and together in the treatment of chronic disease. And so I think it looks like currently that's where the obesity landscape is heading. And then it's how, how do we use these drugs in combination with surgery? Because I think currently people are sort of seeing this as a, as a rival, if you like, or an alternative treatment to surgery. And certainly surgery is not for everybody. And having options is a great thing. But I, you know, I see them as an adjunct to surgery. And we know from some studies that have been done, if you had bariatric surgery and you add in a GLP-1 afterwards, you get even more weight loss than you got with the surgery alone. So there's a range of options. Now that's not an indication that, that um, in the UK, nice have agreed yet, but people are using their drugs in that way with bariatric surgery patients elsewhere in the world at the moment. That's fascinating, isn't it? That shift potentially of going from bariatric surgery to medication. Um, yeah, and I mean, what we're talking about now all sounds really positive and a step in the right direction. But do you think there's any negatives? So you mentioned earlier kind of psychological effects. Do you do you think there are any other downsides? Well, there'll always be downsides. That no, you know, no treatment that we give in the medical profession is without a downside. Um, but as long as the benefits outweigh the risks and for the majority of people, they see a clinical benefit. I have said is that, you know, you initiate people on the drug and you follow them up in that period while you're titrating the dose up. But at six months, if patients haven't lost weight, 
then they should the drug should be stopped and that makes perfect sense because you know if you're giving someone a treatment and it's not working well why should you continue with the treatment um so that's one downside the other current downside i see is that mice have only licensed it for two years in the uk now that will be based on a cost benefit analysis that's not a clinical decision because nice obviously take cost into consideration when they're they're looking at various treatments now i think those of us who treat obesity are a bit worried about that uh, and i think we did talk about this in a previous podcast as well you know because you know it looks very much like from the trial data that when you stop the medication patients will put their weight back on again quite quickly and it may be that as we start using them and we see more widespread benefit and we've got real world data, NICE will revise that uh, ruling. But that's currently you know, where, it, where it is. Uh, and the other issue at the moment is we've talked about the supply of the drug, but then actually it's the, it's the infrastructure to deliver the drug to patients because it's got to be done through a specialist weight management programme. Currently, as again, we've talked about before, the waiting times to start our specialist weight management programs are really long. Most programs are completely overwhelmed with the work they've currently got. And this is effectively a new service. So we're being asked to deliver something new without any extra resource to deliver it on the background of services that are already overwhelmed before this treatment came along. And as as word gets out that patients are starting to get the drug uh, and, and it's being delivered on the NHS through tier three, I can only see the demand increasing significantly. So there are issues, um, definitely. So we, we talked a bit earlier about how the, well, you mentioned earlier about how the, one of the big side effects is um, uh, suicidal ideations. And obviously we mentioned in another podcast that bariatric patients in particular tend to have poorer mental health. Um, if we were going to have this change to a medication based instead of surgical based, is there that psychiatric or mental health support available for those patients, or is that not that would obviously have to come in? Would yeah, so that's one of the reasons that NICE has said currently they have to be delivered through a tier three weight management program because part of a tier three weight management program is to have psychology. So I think if they're being delivered in the way that I say they should be delivered through the NHS, then patients should get that support in the same way as a patient seeking bariatric surgery would get that support. Now, of course, if you're buying it over the internet or you're getting it privately from someone who's never met you previously over the internet, then of course you don't have any of that assessment uh, or or support. And uh, I, I don't I don't think we should. Um, over over stress the suicidal um, risk I, it's very very low clearly it's significant for those patients and families affected but the numbers are are tiny but the principle of patients uh, having treatment for their obesity being supported in a psychological uh, for psychological problems is is absolutely vital uh, and again as is close monitoring which is why you know it makes sense that tier three specialist weight management programs are the place to do this because we've also got the dietitians and the exercise therapists and all the other people who are skilled in treating obesity but sadly those services are you know underfunded for the volume of patients that they're currently seeing and i think the glp ones will exacerbate that situation at the moment do you think though if we if we make that switch that there would be more funding available for that support because they've been maybe having less surgery i'm not sure that people will be having less surgery um i think potentially i think potentially in the short term we may see more patients opting for treatments with glp1s rather than surgery but i think particularly if nice sticks with this two-year uh, duration I think that could push more people towards surgery in the medium to long term, because let's say you've been started on a GLP-1, you've done really well, you've lost 15% of your body weight, 
your diabetes has gone into remission, your hypertension's got better. Then at the end of two years, we say, sorry, you've had your two years, you're on your own. And you start to put your weight back on, you, you know, your medical problems start to come back. Your only other option then is bariatric surgery. If you stick with what the NHS currently has to offer. So I can see a scenario where more patients will end up having surgery uh, as a result of it. And there will be some people who don't want to take a medication, you know, weekly. There'll be some people who can't inject themselves because they don't like it or they don't want to do it. So I don't think surgery is going anywhere. And as I said, I think they're both very good treatment options for the same problem. But I don't think one is going to replace the other. And as I said, I see a future where medication and surgery are all part of a treatment pathway for, for appropriate patients. You know, the flip side of that is that there are lots of patients who are not eligible for surgery or who can't have surgery for various reasons that previously we haven't really had another treatment option for them. Now we've got GLP-1. So that's a brilliant thing for those patients. So the more options we have, the better it is. A hundred percent. Yeah, giving that patient autonomy yeah. and an option yeah. to try different things and see what works for them best. Um, fascinating to see where this will go. I think on that note, we'll we'll finish this podcast here as we'll be doing another one on bariatric surgery. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.